Oh, Harry! Thank you. Brilliant. We can get started now, can't we? You look a little confused, Harry. I'll get you a do you not know why you and they are here? Well, I'd best explain the Nanta. Now, where to begin? Well, my name's Rachel, and this is Harry. Wave to the people, Harry. Lovely. You're here, folks, because you're going to see a play today. Isn't that great, Harry? Do you know what it's about? You don't? Well, I'd best explain the Nanta. Now, where to begin? So, you're here today at the National Coal Mining Museum. It's a very special place, isn't it, Harry? This very land you're stood on right now has a whole humongous, merhusive, ginormous, oh, sorry, long history. You get the picture. Mining goes back a long way, and along that way, a lot of changes have happened, aren't they, Harry? And you've seen some of those changes, haven't you? Yes, you have. And one of those changes has a very long name called nationalisation. You see, folks, there was a time in the not too long ago distant that past that we call dun 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 pre nationalisation. Oh, there was bad times. But then there came a time in the less distant past that we call post nationalisation. And in the true northern sentiment for embellishing the positive, it were all right. Well, yes, Harry, that's why you're here. You see, folks, Harry here worked out mines before and after nationalisation. Before, when things were eat bad, and he was still there after, when things got a bit better. But Harry has a very special tale, because he didn't go working down the mines like others did. He came to be down there by a very different way to most of the miners. Yes, we are telling your story today. Is that OK? Brilliant. Now, where to begin? <laughs> oh. Harry! Oh. Harry! Where are you, lad? Harry! Oh, hey, Harry. Sounds like that's in a bit of bother. we best get a shift on, otherwise we'll get a clip round here. Well, come on, folks, let's see who wants, Harry. Come on, then. Come on, then. It's a bit wet in it. It's not very nice. Harry, I'll still. But I'll get you a clip round here, all. That's filthy. You can't go to that school looking like this. There's enough mud under them nails to go spuds in. Keep still, I say. Oh, Harry, that's your mother, isn't it? Ah, yes. Yeah. She was thorough in a washing of you, wasn't she? It was for a very special reason. What was that reason? An interview at the grammar school. Hey, that's not bad going for a lad from your neck of the woods, is it? I bet your mum were really proud of you. Oh, Harry, I'm very right proud. Oh! Hello, you lot. Have you come to see our Harry? Yep. Have you? Say hello, Harry. Harry! Hello, Harry. <laughs> hello, Mr Montgomery. I'm Harry Parks. Good morning, Master Parks. Mrs Parks. Welcome to our school. Let's get started, shall we? Now oh, I see here you've passed your 11 plus exam. Is that right? Yes, sir. He did. And he did all right and all. Very good. Now, Mrs. Parks, I understand that it's just you and Harry, is that correct? Cheeky beggar! What's he trying to say about us? Ooh. You tell him, Harry. Yeah, just us. <laughs> just me and Harry. That's all right. I see. Now, Master Parks, I see here that you live quite far away. How will you travel to school? The bus is quite expensive from where you live. And of course, there is the uniform and the sports kit. They don't come cheap, you know. Is that it again? What's he trying to say about us? Go on, Harry, you tell him all. Well, Mr Montgomery, sir, I've been saving up my pocket money for ages, and I've got just enough to buy a second-hand bike. It's bright blue as well, it's bright nice. And I will ride it to school every day. I see. Mm-hmm. What's he writing on that paper? I suppose he had to ask you all sorts of questions. I bet you gave very good answers though, didn't you? Look, it looks like he's about to tell you his decision. Well, Master Parks, I've looked over your application here and unfortunately, I just don't think grammar school is right for you. Perhaps you'd be better with something a little uh, cheaper, closer to home. Well, thank you both for your time. Goodbye, Harry.
Didn't I do okay, ma'am? You did wonderfully, love. We don't need a big posh school, do we? What do you think, folks? Yeah. No. You did right, good lad, and I'm right proud of you. You never quite know what's round corner. Hey, and Harry, think on. They'll not need a bath for ages. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Harry, you must have been so disappointed when you didn't get into grammar school. But knowing you, I bet you weren't down for long. And, as your mum said, you never know what's round corner, do you? In fact, shall we actually go and see right now what actually is around the corner? Come on, folks, follow us. Stating that, unless we had heard from them by 11 o'clock the following morning that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and consequently this country is at war with Germany. Oh, Harry, that's awful. How old were you when war broke out? You were 12. That's only a bit older than most of the boys and girls here. There must have been tough times for you and your mum. Ah, yes, I forgot. It were you and your mum against the world. But as the war went on, I bet you were like a lot of young men and you wanted to do your bit. I can imagine that, as you strike me as always having been very brave. So, what happened next? Oh, hold on, Harry, wait for me. Come on, folks, Harry's in a hurry to show us what happened sir, sir. next. I couldn't learn to swim, sir. Then you can't join the Navy then, lad. Off down the corridor to the RAF officer. Oh, no, Harry, you can't join the Navy. It was the Navy you really wanted to join, wasn't it? Now then, me boy, are you a volunteer with you? And I am the current Minister for Labour and for National Service. It is my job, our job, to solve this current fuel crisis. It's the war machine. It's hungry. I'm talking about fuel. Fuel for factories, for the armed forces, people's homes. In short, we need more coal. Now, we have plenty of coal in this country, an absolute abundance of the stuff. But what we need are miners, good, strong, healthy ones. Now, there was a time when the hills were teeming with young lads with shovels and picks in hand. But thanks to the war, they've all been packed up and shipped out to fight the key and country. But miners are just as vital as soldiers. We need an army of miners. For coal! Yes, yes, I like that. A, a mining army. We need young men, particularly those between 18 to 25 years of age. We need 720,000 men continuously employed in this industry. Our fighting forces cannot achieve their purpose unless they have an adequate supply of coal! So, any ideas? Are we going to solve this problem? No? You? No? Right, thinking caps on all of you at the front. Let's get this over and done with. Come on. Any ideas? No? It, it. Ah! By Jove, I think I've got it. Uh, here, my dear, hand these up and get them to come to my desk. Right, right here we are, all of you. Look, make sure you can get a ticket now, won't you? Here we are. Thank you very much. Take that. One for you. Ticket for you. Oh, there we are. Be careful, you're going to need that one for you. One for you. Then you're going to have to get the ticket. One for you. One for you. One for you. Ah, then anyone else? You need a ticket, you do. One for two of you. You need a ticket. Make sure you go down that pit, won't you? There's one for you. Oi, I saw that far in it. Oh, there's another one, thank you. You got your ticket. This is a nice office, isn't it, Harry? Do you know what he does here? Ah, so this is Ernest Bevin's office. He's the man that decided who had to go down the mine instead of off to war. He's the 
reason your life took an unexpected turn. Shall I have a look and see what he's going to do now? You have a morning meeting with the Prime Minister at 10 a.m. Uh -huh. Reports on the new agreement must be completed and sent off by 11.30. Right. I booked you in for lunch with Florence at 12.30. <laughs> and then your day is clear until 3 p.m. when you have another briefing to attend to. Right. Tea, sir? Uh, yes, please, Betty. Uh, no sugar, though. <laughs> I'm sweet enough. <laughs> Mr. Bevan, you certainly are in a good mood today. Yes, well, I ought to be. I have figured out a foolproof plan which will solve all of our coal worries and, in turn, help with the war effort. Oh, I knew you'd sort it out eventually, sir. <laughs> now then, this is what is going to happen. We are going to hold a fortnightly ballot whereby young men aged between 18 to 25 years upon registering for national service, will be selected according to the last digit of their national registration number. A draw will be made of numbers between 0 to 9, and any man whose last digit of their national registration number will be sent off to the mine. And we are holding the very first draw this very day, December 14, 1943. And uh, how are we going to do that? Uh, uh, ah, hand me my hat, my dear. <laughs> okay then, I am now going to draw out a number. And if this is on the end of your ticket, then you're off to the mines. Well, if that's how it has to be, then at least it's fair and it's randomless. It is the answer to all of our cool worries. Right then, let's get this over and done with. And the first number is a three. Anybody with a three on the end of their national ticket? You, sir? Oh, I want you. Anybody else? We'll have you. You there? Excellent stuff. You at the front? Excellent. Got quite a few there. Right here. This is going to go swimmingly. Uh, the second number is a five. You, sir? Excellent. And you at the front? Any more? Well, we've got plenty at the back, don't we, sir? Right here. Excellent. Well, then. Splendid. Now that you're all going to be serving your country, I would like to assure you that even though you are staying on home ground, your contribution is vital. You will all be receiving a letter of where you are to go to receive your new duties. I will try to ensure that you are sent somewhere either close to home or of your choice. But in wartime, we must all make great sacrifices and I cannot guarantee that this will be the case. Hugh, Harry, looks like you've avoided being sent down the pits. But sir, uh, it looks like there's another number to be pulled out. Harry! Harry! Oh, let's just come for you. What's it say? It says I'm going down pit this, ma. Oh, oh heck. Heck. Right there, everybody, chop, chop that way, if you please. And remember... Right, uh, I know what you're thinking. Uh, the Yeti thump and the Eve world. Well, that's a story, but we haven't got all day, so I'll be quick. Things are about to get great political. So I have been drafted in as the Yorkshire translator to make sure they know exactly what is going on at this point in history. This chap here is Clement Zatley. Say hello, Atley. Hello. Magical. Now, <laughs> he's pretty important. He was the first Deputy Prime Minister of Great Britain, leader of the Labour Party, and is considered one of the most influential Prime Ministers of all time! However, it's 1944, we haven't got there yet, so all Jurosses. At the minute, He's deputy to Churchill. No, no, no. Not the one that sells car insurance on telly. It's other one. Oh, yes. <laughs> ah, this gent over here is William Beveridge. Say hello, Bev. Hello. Fabulous. Now, the conversation these two blokes are having is about to change Great Britain. But more importantly, the mining industry. So they need to listen. Oh, uh, well, I'll say I would much rather speak with you, Mr. Hattie. I hear you have plans to run against Churchill. Winston Churchill is 50% genius, 50% fool, but the people love him. 
I would much rather keep the coalition. Oh, stop! Nah, four ranks even ended yet, and people are already talking about how we're going to rebuild Britain. During the war, there were a coalition between all the parties led by Churchill. Churchill is a man of war and not much else. He has no intention to act upon my report. Oh, stop! I shall probably explain that bit, eh? In 1942, Beveridge went on a tour around Britain and made a report on how people live. And as you can imagine, things were pretty back then. Living conditions weren't great, especially for us Northerners. Now, where do you live? Sorry? Oh, no, I heard. I'm just sorry. Listen <laughs> <laughs> and Bev, you're the one to write that one down. Lovely. Now, at your house, do you have a bath? Aye. Well, not many people did back then. So, he took stuff like that and bobbed it in his report. And it became pretty obvious, pretty quickly, that things needed changing. There is no inherent social mechanism in our present system. And I believe that you are the man to create a new system of social security. One of which that could tackle the five giant evils of society. Oh, stop! Can't be fashions, everyone. The one's actually five giants. Roaming about the dales. No, it was just an expression. Beveridge here believed everything wrong in Britain came down to these five things. Want, disease, squalor, ignorance and idleness. The five evil giants. He called them. He thought if we fixed these things, Britain would be better. And he thought Atlee would be the man to do it. If you fix these things, then Britain will be better. And I believe you are the man to do this. Of course, a lack of education, poor housing, all of these things affect the poor. The very people who are right now fighting to protect this country. It must be corrected. And you are right! You are well smart, that beverage. Atlee used that report as a backbone to his political campaign. Only a few short months later, Atlee became Prime Minister. Now, have we ever been to hospital or used the NHS? Mm -hmm. Aye, when well, you've got Atlee and Beveridge to thank for that. You think coal mining were easy? Well, it wasn't, especially before Atlee. It wasn't easy after either, but it was better. Now, I was about to find out exactly what went on before and after Atlee and Beveridge did their jobs. I've got to go now. Got my whippets to see to. Ta-ra, everyone! Ta-ra! Yeah. Right, you. Know, I think it's time for the mines. Thank you. Yes, I've been down to the mines, everybody. Stop wasting time. Right, then, can I have all the children first, please? If that's all right. Children, to front. Come on, you lot. Get your pickaxes. It's time to do it. Very much. It's all dirty in here, isn't it? Is that you over there? You don't look very happy to be here, do you? Who is that over there? Harry says that's the mine owner. I hope we don't get into trouble for being down here. He looks like a very serious man. Now then, I hear you lot want to know more about mining as it stands at this point in time. Now before we get started, I need to clear up a few things. Us mine owners get a bad rap in this industry and I need to set the record straight. We've come a long way from the days of women and kids being down in the mines. I've heard tell from my grandfather that in order to make sure money was coming into the house, pregnant women would be giving birth down the pit one day and be back at work the next. Aye, and that there were little ones as young as four working down in the dark. But let me tell you, that was all put a stop to in 1842. Now, yes, there were accidents. It's a dangerous profession. By 1870, over a thousand lives were still being lost in mining accidents each year. So, in 1872, the Coal Mines Regulation Act introduced the requirement for pit managers to have state certification of their training. That meant I had to get mine for my pit to stay open. And if there were an accident in my mine, it would be investigated by the Home Secretary. So, we took measures to ensure that that didn't happen. Now, as you can see from their heads, these fellas have good, sturdy hats. If that's that, let's see how hard that is. See? Good, 
paper constructed acts. We are that good to our miners these days that we let them purchase these themselves <laughs> so they don't go bashing their noggins. Excuse me, did you just say paper hats? Aye, and you'll not get that everywhere, you know. In other mines, they had to make do with stuffing their own flat caps with dusters. <laughs> Here, and before you get all of it, we did a good job of looking after our miners. They could buy a pair of work boots from us, better than having to use their normal shoes. We are a business, not a charity. Here, lad. Tell them, lad. Tell them how good we are to you. Oh, yes, uh, very good. I get to wear my own overalls and I get to replace them if they're worn out. Thanks, lad. Back to work. Coal won't dig itself. Where's that phone of mine? I'm here, sir. Now then, this is Michael, the foreman. He'll show you the mine. Yes, sir. Here, and don't let him keep you too long. I hate to have to dock the men's wages. But charming. Now, this is my shift. And these are my men. We work on the butcher system. I have a contract for coal with the mine owner. If each shift digs out enough to meet the contract, I get paid and then I pay the men. And if not, well, that's their fault, isn't it? They should have dug harder. Here, John, come over here. Now he's worked all over and he knows he's got it good now. Hi, see a fair bit in my time. And I've seen a lot of these lads too. <coughs> The heat down here gets right uncomfortable sometimes. So much so that we often have to work down here naked, not even wearing our socks. And every so often we'll take our boots off and we have to pull the sweat out. Now we've got them Bevin boys coming down here, getting a right eyeful. For most of them, it's the first day is honest work they've ever done in their lives. Pushing tubs in and out of lifts, crushing their delicate little fingers. I mean, look at this one. What have you got to say about it, Parks? I hate it. The atmosphere, the, the conditions we're supposed to work under. I'm not even seeing a coal face. I'm working all the time. That's enough all... from you, Parks. Hey, it's happened, lads. It's happened. It's January 1st, 1947, and this calling is now made by the National Coal Board on behalf of the people, for the people. Come on, <laughs> let's get out and sort of celebrate. Follow us, everybody. Nationalisation, the pits of by the nation. You can stay, I'll tell you what, I'll have a word with that directly. Well, 
soon pick up the song. <laughs> Come on, keep on coming, you yeah, lot. Plenty of us. Yes. The peace of my nation, for future generations, it will reign. Training and education, welfare and recreation, some joint celebration. Now, if they want to know what happens next, you're going to have to follow me and Harry here. Come on, Harry. 
seen a ceiling before <laughs> and I says listen I want you to go to Corridors of Power and I want you to get somebody to make a, a proper memorial for Bevin boys and I want you to put it in the Memorial Arboretum well I turned back at some of boys they're all clapping <laughs> and uh, I felt an hand on my shoulder with this lady in a beautiful blue dress and gold chains. And she says, can I help you? And she did. And we sent up all these begging letters to all local authorities. And that's how we got us funded. Uh. So I, I 
set about sketching and designing. And on May 7th, 2013, uh. Countess of Wessex come to Arbor Eaton and she unveiled it. And it was the proudest moment of my life. I was bursting with pride. She had tears in her eyes and she hugged me. And, and that's how we got this memorial. That's why we're here. Now, I've said it before. I hated every minute of being a baby boy. Some of them took to it. But I, ne I never took to it. So I stayed on 17 more years <coughs> because our poor board had treated me. I needed to pay him back. Could have been that uh, I could have been there forever. But they directed me to another outlet. And that's that. <laughs> My story. Now, Harry, I think you're missing a very vital point that these here folks should know about. Ooh, What's that? Getting your medal from the Queen! Oh yes! <laughs> Another proud moment in my life. I was awarded the British Empire Medal. That must have been a tremendous feeling. Well, it's like this, you see. I carry flags for Bevin boys. And, and it's an honour. Now, I may not be the Queen, but it would be my pleasure to pin this medal on your overalls for you, Harry. Here we go. Perfect. Now, Harry, what do you say to us going and finding somewhere to get a cuppa? You must be far too happy sharing your story with us. Well, off we go then. There's one more place you'd like to go. And you'd like these good folks to come too. Well, I think we'd best follow Harry, haven't we, folks? Come on, let's have see where he wants to take us. Come on then, please, this way. Played their part in the rich history of coal mining and the fight to bring Britain back the catastrophe. But today, we remember folks whose lives were forever changed, the Bevin boys. The lives of 48,000 men reflected by the ballots in Bevin's office. What you are about to hear, the names of some of those men from Yorkshire, who should always be recognised for their service during and beyond the dark days of World War II. Beric Hiley. Harold Clough. Don Brooks. David Reekey. Holland, Stanley Haig, and, of course, Harry Park. Now then, Harry, what do you say about going to get a cup of now? <laughs> and you guys coming, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Right, before we go, we say to head to these nice folk. Yeah. performances a day and on Friday we're absolutely honoured that Harry Parks was in the audience, 94 year old. Oh. <laughs> it was unbelievable and, and, and Harry has worked with these young people and Tina and Richie Teasdale at the back to put all this together. This was Harry's story in his own words and when he went round and saw his mum having me in the back Oh, when the man said, oh, the man was really tough, he was going, yes, he was. He was. It was just really, really, so an absolute giant of a man, a giant of a story delivered by these fantastic young people. So I'd just like to say thank you to you lot. I'll buy you a pint just now. <laughs> or two. And I would like to say a big thank you to Richard Teasdale for everything he's done.
today and why why you came and sort of li listened to us today. Yeah, hi, my name's James Graham and uh, I just came on impromptu today, I didn't realise the production was on. Uh, it's just so amazing because it's like I was seeing the story of my father's life and I never realised really what he did and back in the war he was a Bevan boy and um, what that meant was never clear to me. Um, I did work down the mines myself, just on a very short project for a few months, I understood the conditions. But back in the war, and what they were doing down there, I had no idea about how difficult it was without the machinery and without the, the roof supports. And, and the young man who was playing the actual thing, actually, it was like looking at my father's life. It was quite incredible. And he then joined, um, uh, well, he, he, he worked his way up to be a pit manager, and the manager. At, uh, and down Ellington and Colliery and in and Ashington, and then he but joined the, the mining machinery companies. Um, one was and the Shearer Company, which was ground, Anderson Boys, and then he joined Doughty's, which was the hydraulic roof supports, and then he, he ended up um, as a director in that company. And eventually, he joined the, the sort of opposition, Gullick Dobson, and Gullick Dobson did mining roof supports and all other things. And yeah, he, well, he ended future, up as managing director, he actually decided yeah. to run the place. Yeah. So yeah. just to come today and to see into your play. Such like, we want to modernise the industry. Uh, You're living in the past, man. Uh, it made me very emotional He's because I never realised. He looked after my father, my, yeah. my grandfather. Just what right? my dad did. We've got an so he didn't always ourselves. kind of share that he with you. He also built a school. No, he never. Right? So it's never nice to kind of it. be able to <coughs> tell the story, really. We have shot. Yeah. It's nice and to be able to tell the story yeah, and, and for other people to hear it as well. Yeah, all and of that is it's guaranteed. just amazing because you've got it so now, accurate what you did. Now, why would I like to swap that? And, um, I think because it's based on the life of a Bevan boy. Yeah. They've, they've scripted it based on his memories and recollections. So yeah, I that's think been really and important. And it's totally accurate. So, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks so much to everybody for doing it. Thank really, you. Really, really thank <laughs> 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 yeah, it's just saying anything that you'd like about what your involvement in the, in the production and anything that you might have done behind the scenes, how you felt it's gone the last few days. I think it's gone really well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Surprisingly big audiences. Yeah, yeah. definitely. It's very, doesn't it, yeah. really? From like yeah. little ones to about eight or so people to this one today yeah. that's had a bit of a To be fair, as well, the age range. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Literally yeah. like five, six year olds and then up to, up to 90. 90 or yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> else 90. Yeah. 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 Do, do you think the audience has enjoyed it? Have you had a lot of feedback? Yeah, they seem yeah. to have really enjoyed it. See, people that like have been minors and stuff say that they've enjoyed it, so that's. Yeah, yeah we've. I've, we've sort of been asking people as they've been leaving what they thought about it and um, uh, quite a few people have been really moved and even somebody today I spoke to said they'd done a bit of research before they came because they were so interested in the story. That's so, yeah, well, I think what, it's nice to do something in the community as well, not in a, in a theatre, but yeah. doing something out in the yeah. local cool. yeah. Yeah. area kind of thing. Yeah, I don't think it would have the same impact if we did it like in the theatre yeah. or something yeah. like that, like doing actually here about mining. Yeah. Yeah. In a mine. Have, in you, mine. Yeah. Have, have any of you done this kind of promenade theatre before? Some of us have, yeah. 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 I personally not. No. Uh, but I know Becky has before. 
Yeah. So it's good experience, I guess, yeah. just yeah, in very different to being in a theatre and just so oh, it is. you've got kind of a social contract when you're in a theatre whereas outside yeah. here anything can happen yeah, anything goes basically yeah. yeah you've got to respond to like yeah. the audience as well as you're going yeah. along I haven't you like it's really similar to like, maybe doing like live tv yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 you have no idea and anything but really well, I had some guy tap <laughs> I was trying to be sad in the mind and some guy tap me and was like cheer up it might never happen <laughs> 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 kind of so <laughs> Yeah. Never mind. <laughs> I, I like the fact as well as, as you've gone along, you've all kind of started ad libbing more as well, yeah. which has been quite nice to see. It's getting, yeah. it's getting more and more adventurous. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's more more confident. Confident. <laughs> it's more confident with it, though. You yeah. get to yeah. know the piece and you get to know what you can get work away with, with the audience. Yeah. And yeah. 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 Especially, yeah, especially after a couple of scenes, you start to get the feel of the audience so yeah. you can yeah. have a bit more of a joke with them and a bit more of a. Yeah. And yeah, you don't have to react to it. Especially yeah. the kids, like the kids are like, yeah. 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 you just think about You're it. You're sort of scared of them now. You mess around with them. Like, yeah. I think it's nice that it's something we've written, we're not just doing a play that someone we've yeah. never met wrote once. We yeah. work together to, to create it and to yeah. 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 So you feel right. almost very much involved with the story, more, more so than you would do in another play. Yeah, yeah. yeah. a lot of yeah. research and yeah. 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 We've researched and we've met Harry as well. Yeah. Met yeah. Harry. Yeah. 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 He was the kind of catalyst for it all. Yeah. It was nice yeah. to have Harry here for one of the performances. Yeah, I think he would have really enjoyed it today because he would have seen how many more people were here today. Yeah. But, yeah. but I think he really, really enjoyed it. And this video is kind of partly for him as well, so that he's got a record of Hi, it. Hi, Harry! So. <laughs> 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 do you feel? Do you feel like? Do you feel like you can keep going? Or have you had enough now? I don't want to stop. I don't want to stop. I don't want to, I don't want to go back to work. Can we just come on it over and over again? We'll, we'll, we'll go to the point. Point. now. We'll keep performing yeah. this forever. We'll go to the point where we're comfortable, we're comfortable with it and we know what yeah. we're saying. So we'll just keep performing. Yeah. 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 Over and over again. Yeah. 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 We're yeah. back in the summer for minimum wage and uh, yeah. trips. We'd love you to come back. Okay, that's brilliant.